All right. Yeah, I'm really happy to be sitting down with Ken Williams, Elizabeth Wanning. They they run um, a movement, a ministry, an expression called Changed. And we have been diving deep. We've been exploring around this big idea of healthy sexuality. It's just been so fascinating to me. I've been learning a ton. And again, I want to lead with that idea. Like we, we do these conversations to learn. Uh, we really are not going after, for me as a leader of Justice Collective, I'm not really going after like, hey, I want to make my opinion known about topics. I really want to sit down with people that are active in certain areas of topics of what I would call our social need or real prevalent issues in our generation. And I want to learn from them. And you'll notice on our platform, we have voices coming from different kind of areas of these different topics. And to me, I just find that exciting. I love it. I love that we get to learn. And all that to be said, you know, for discussing healthy sexuality, like I just did not want to exclude the conversation around um, same-sex attraction, anything within the gay landscape. I know that there's different terms. Those terms seem to morph from month to month. So um, I'll just take a stab at like, you know, LGBT, maybe, maybe we'll say that. But again, we're talking specifically about the gay lifestyle, sexuality around that space. Um, I don't even think the word homosexuality is even used anymore, but so excited to sit down with Ken and Elizabeth. Uh, they've been active addressing this and, and they both have that in the story and their background. Um, why don't you guys just lead with what you're doing with Changed, um, maybe your backgrounds, take as much time as you want. And again, really thankful to be sitting down with you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so, thanks so much, Jan, Lance. It's just great to be able to join you and just leading into this conversation, the little bit of off camera time that we had earlier, it's um, exciting what Justice Collective is doing in my opinion, mm -hmm. like meeting a need, just focusing on all these tough these tough areas where Christianity, the intersection of Christianity and sexuality really is being confronted. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And with my having known you for over 20 years, just your heart, your, your compassionate pastoral heart. I, I love that that's the person that's, that's leading this um, because it's just what, it's what the world needs. Like not just the rules, but like the understanding and the compassion which really is how we got into this ministry, having both come out of homosexual uh, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, you, when, when the Lord does something like that in your life, it's obviously, a, it, it truly is a paradigm shift. It's like flat earth to a round earth, you know, for, yeah. for us. And when you do that, and then you come into contact with people who are in pain, mm -hmm. you know, so someone that, that is trying to find themselves or is uh, searching for the relationship that will bring freedom. And I'm talking about someone with an LGBTQ background or leanings. And then you encounter these people and you know what God has done for you. You kind of can't help but want to say, here, <laughs> come closer. Let's talk. You know, is yeah. there is there some pain underneath this this struggle for you? Yeah. And uh, would a same sex sexual relationship be the be the solution for you or yeah. is that something that's appealing because of emotional pain that's underneath or wow. trauma that happened or rejection or abandonment etc so yeah. I and mean, that's those are the types of things that got us into this ministry is we we care like you do so so thanks for having us on today yeah no i i'm so happy you're you're here and i think there's a lot to talk about here so so let's let's go a little bit deeper there, what you just shared, you know, when, when you're interacting with those that are in, in a gay lifestyle, you're approaching the dynamic of health and wellness. How are you doing? And, um, and again, it comes from your own story. So, so within your story in your guys experience of living, living in a gay lifestyle, is your like your story is hey I wasn't healthy when I was there or do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, you like me to go first. Don't you? <laughs> I do. 
uh, yeah, I um, she was out in the lifestyle, living in the in the gay community. I never was doing that. I was the church kid okay. uh, who got saved at eight years old okay. in in a church background where they didn't have any modality for inner healing ministry. Sure. And and so you know, hey, I got saved there. You can't be too critical. You know, I found Jesus there, and um, and started a, a life in Him. But then when you know I was uh, exposed to hardcore gay pornography as an eight or nine year old. Mm. And then that catalyzed touching from the other boys who witnessed the, the very graphic, uh, mm. trauma. I mean, the things that I saw on those pages, most people would have no clue that homosexual, uh, sexual interaction would include those types of mm. aggressive and degrading things. Mm. But so, you know, I lost a lot of respect for men, for males in what I witnessed there. Okay. Add, add to that, I was the scrawny, skinny male, you know, growing up. And so nobody, no, no young boy, you know, gets into the line requesting that, you know, it's like, yeah. um, I had to, uh, I felt like I was always losing, you know, I was always picked last in gym class, for example. Okay. So, okay. yeah, you know, other males weren't really at the top of my list of people that I was celebrating because I felt like they were against me, you know? Oh. Uh. Um, you know, so, um, and then after having been touched inappropriately and all that, it, it opened up a window that, or a door that I don't think God ever intended to be opened for me. Yeah. And so, I mean, mostly from, in my case, I, I canceled masculinity without realizing it. Okay. And, and the problem is if I'm male, if we have a, a, a scientific understanding of sexuality or of gender, yeah. Or if we have a biblical understanding, then there's male and female are the only two. You can't just manifest yourself in the world as a person. You're yeah. manifesting as either male or female biologically. Yeah. So if I have rejected my maleness, mm -hmm. think about how compli how complicated that is or how problematic that is. You know, mm -hmm. to me, it's like trying to take the yeast out of bread. Like it's it's woven all through there. You can't wow. pull one apart from the other. And yet emotionally, I had tried to do that. So okay. I was constantly trying to find the missing me, yeah. which I was trying to find my masculinity, but now it's, mo it's most on display in other men. And so I was looking for strength. I was looking for a feeling of being on top as a male and all that. And so it was much easier to try to find that by uh, objectifying another male than it was to find it in myself. Okay. So, you know, was it sexual? Well, it was sexualized and I did have mm -hmm. inappropriate interactions sexually in, you know, several different scenarios over, over the years um, with other males, but it never actually met my need um emotionally yeah. i never you know if i had a some encounter with a guy the minute he left my house i was back to trying to find who i was i'm i'm seriously hours later i'm feeling lonely sure so that was that was me and then in uh you know experienced a uh I, I was suicidal when i was 17 over the struggle okay i guess i wanted to i i saw very clearly in the bible that homosexuality was not condoned by god and I wanted to please the Lord. I wanted to align with what I saw him leading me toward, but I had no ability yeah. to do that mentally or, you know, I was just hooked on needing, yeah. on pursuing males uh, yeah. in a sexual sense. Did you have any, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm nursing a cold. Um, did you have any opposite sex attraction in that season? I mean, that you remember? I, I mean, only in hindsight with the lens I have now, can I recognize that I had any opposite sex attraction? Yeah, I had a little, but it was very fledgling, and it was not ne not nearly as intense or strong or consistent. Yeah. So, so I mean, it, at the time, it felt like no, because in comparison to this male that I'm looking at, that it was just not even a, a fair fight there. Yeah. Um, and so I'm so I'm I ended up being suicidal came mm. out to my youth pastor he had made me tell my parents which was the right thing in my case okay. and we cried for a couple hours that evening and my parents said what what can we do for you what do you want and i said well i don't i don't want to live this life but i don't have any idea i've prayed a thousand times it felt like for yeah. god to take this away 
and he hadn't taken the desire away. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he started seeing a Christian psychologist who I saw weekly for five years who kept me alive and he hooked up the IVs, you know, to me, yeah. um, created the safe space that I desperately needed. I mm -hmm. just needed to know that I could t say whatever it was and not get in trouble. Right. Totally. Um, but then an encounter with God where I had a physical healing in my body is what opened my eyes to, oh my gosh, God cares. Wow. Like he's good and he cares. He healed me of something that I had gotten sick as a result of drinking five beers in 20 minutes and passing out. Yeah. And, and I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't deserve to be healed. So who is this person that looks, steps over my sin and says, I'm going to heal you yeah. because I'm good, not because you're good. Yeah. And, and so that, that, I mean, the long story short, that's what catalyzed my, my realizing, oh my gosh, God's really good. Yeah. Surely he would not be someone who would say this is wrong and then give me desire for that or not help me with that. Yeah. So I, I began my pilgrimage there and that led me to, to Bethel uh, to, as a ministry school student. And then just transform tr being transformed by the renewing of my mind over years, Lance, that was yeah. You know, it was really a seven year process, probably um, from that point of realizing that he's in this fight with me until I started to experience a shift in my desires and uh, and in my in my identity of myself. Yeah. And so then I've been married to my wife for almost 16 years. We have four children together and mm -hmm. and I've been doing leading this ministry for six or seven years, along with Elizabeth. Which I, I, what what's your guys take here? Because my, you know it feels like sexuality and identity are just like, like you mentioned earlier, the yeast, you can't pull the yeast yeah. out, of the, out of the bread. It's like when, when there is a sense of self or when identity is, I don't know the right word, healthy formed. Yeah. Like the sexuality seems to flow from that place. And so maybe is that accurate? Is that an accurate statement? Like, like unhealthy sexuality flows from unhealthy identity. Again, I know that's a really narrow term. You know, what, whether you're talking about same sex sexual feelings or whether you're talking about opposite sex sexual feelings, yeah. that's an outflow of your, your body's input, what you've learned, and then also um, your deep need for intimacy. Yep. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, in, in terms of what you're seeing with sex trafficking and other things, I mean, you sexualize something in order to get as close to another person as you possibly can. Wow. And so if you're feeling distant or disconnected from other people, yeah. Yeah. Whatever, what, no matter their sex, then sexualizing that relationship is a way to, to be fully seen in a so way. So good. Yes. You know, so. I, one of the questions that you had asked earlier that I think is pertinent here is that, so you said, what's going on in our, in our moment? Why is, yeah. why is this blowing up in the way that it is? And I think, you know, same sex sexual behavior is ancient. Like the ancient cultures um, saw this behavior, but never normalized it. Okay. And I mean, it, it can also be an active choice. Like, in sure. ancient history is men subjugated other men through sex yeah. men and women right yeah. as an act of subjugation but even in say the greek and roman cultures it was highly controversial you can pick up philosophers who on one hand would be puzzled over why is this happening why do they do that and there was controversy some were yeah. opposed to that behavior others were for it there was there's always been a question of where is this coming from for a certain segment of people Okay. And it's also been a choice for some, you know, not sure. everyone, but for some, those behaviors. But so in our moment today, um, one of the things that I see is this very, very great disconnect. Um, and I, I think that this is a due to the tech revolution, okay. a very, very great dissociation from our inner world, our psyche, from our, from the physical body. All right. You know, like, I think the easiest way to understand this is to think about the feminist movement and, you know, the feminist movement, which um, of which I'm a great benefactor yeah. um, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, there was this confrontation over women um, 
having intellectual equality with men. Okay. And, and women a century ago, the terminology of the weaker sex, the weaker sex correlated not just with their physicality, the assumption was that because she was physically weaker, she was also intellectually weaker. Wow. So a great triumph of the feminist movement is being able to say, you know, we, we can go toe to toe in a conversation. Yeah. Um, I can't lift or as worse. much as Ken, you know, <laughs> but okay. But what that's given us today. So then partner that with the tech revolution where you've got condoms and you've got um, surrogacy and you've got um, abortion and contraception. So now we're able to dominate our bodies in a way that we never have before, like mm -hmm. sexually, mm -hmm. we can control a great deal sexually. Now we can even transition cosmetically to the opposite gender. Yeah. And, and so the tech revolution is creating this really great dualism in our culture. Yeah. Then coming back to what Ken was saying, I felt this disconnect from my masculinity, but that's impossible. We're losing sight of the fact that physically we can be either male or female. Even, uh, even intersex is a combination of just those two chromosomes. And so like down to the cellular level, I'm female yeah. and I, there's nothing I can do about that. Like my uterus, my vagina, all my procreative system that impacts even what I think and how I think it like, yeah. just ask a PMS woman, a PMSing woman, and you'll know that she's integrally uh, yeah. informed by what's going on inside. Yeah. And so if you have a disconnect from your body, your body is saying sexually, um, I crave sexual behavior. And the only, the only physical complement to a person is the opposite sex. Yeah. Right? Like the sure. vagina doesn't make sense apart from the penis. Sure. Like those two are meant to go together, obviously. Yeah. And so now, but now by virtue of our elevation of the psyche, we're able to say, well, you know, we can make do like we can subjugate our bodies in order to have sexual pleasure with the same sex. Sure. And I feel like that's just being exacerbated in our culture. So, and I think LGBT identifying people or people, let me just say people who experience LGBT because you, yeah. you experience, it's something that you realize within yourself. It's not, it's not a lifestyle choice. It's, I mean, it's a lifestyle choice in how you choose to respond, but those feelings emerge. Mm -hmm. And, and so the question is, do you want to be integrated? Like, do you want to try to, um, fully experience your physicality in a, in alignment with your psychology or, or are you, uh, going to have to shift in order to get emotional needs met? Yeah. And, and so talk about some of what you guys are experiencing in this. Again, it's a really, to me, it feels like a very vast landscape. Like there isn't just one thing that you're experiencing or one type of person you're interacting with. Um, why don't you guys share some of what you guys have been experiencing as you're going about what you're going about. I, I think what you're going about is multiple things right like you you've also been on the legislative front because there there's actual legislation coming down uh relative to this topic you're very much on like a ground level interacting with people one-on-one -on -one. um yeah just share well, what you guys are seeing experiencing talk talk yeah, freely I there mean, I, I think a big controversy and this kind of maybe goes off topic a little bit lance but Part of the controversy is what does it mean to be born again if you're gay? Okay, yeah. And and what? How do you pursue the Lord if that's your life experience? Totally. Yeah, that doesn't feel off topic to me. I think I mean it's something that's happening in culture right now. And um, you know, like for yeah. for Ken and me, we we think that being born again means you're being restored to your female or male sexual identity like yeah there's a big you know that the promise of jesus's new kingdom is that we're all coming into alignment alignment with what that could be and yeah. not that we've arrived boy wouldn't i love to be transfigured today totally but that 
you know, there's a, a restoration that could happen um, as you're following the Lord. And, you know, the battleground there on can you be, can you be born again as a mm. gay person is yeah. hitting the legislative end. And so, you know, depending on where Christians want to land on, on the topic of being born again for a gay person, yeah. that yeah. is, are you going to embrace their gay identity, which Ken and I felt have felt that that's harmful, that that really inhibits the full experience of Christian faith, but other Christians don't feel that way. Yeah. And, and so, you know, but legislation is starting to be able to say, well, um, being born again certainly may never mean <laughs> that you can leave that identity or that you can leave that experience or that you should choose to yeah. abstain from those behaviors. And so legislatively all across the world under the guise of conversion therapy, which gosh, everybody's against what is being claimed as conversion therapy. Like sure. I've heard some terrible, terrible stories and, and I just can't even believe how people would treat other people. Yeah. And I wouldn't even, and, and on top of that, I think that as we think about the conversion therapy, topic and i'm talking it's okay it, is the reality <laughs> that millions of people have sought it out yeah you know yeah. like and why the, is that the gay experience is not as fulfilling you know and yeah. and so many people want to experience a shift in their sexual behaviors towards a biblical creative reality yeah um so, so what is what is legislation is is really causing free speech to be clamped down for pastors and leaders who want to say, yeah, Jesus loves you. He loves you as you are today. And he has redemption for you. Come and be a part of who, uh, be a part of the body of Christ. But you are a man and you're a man among men and you deserve to have that identity as a son of God. Yeah. So what is it, like you, you said, none of us would, would want the kind of conversion therapy that's being described so what you're referring to there would be like coercing forcing vilifying no, like, i don't like no, like well, telling... so this is the category okay let me tell you a story um so yeah. this came out of i i haven't ken and i have not met anyone personally who's experienced something like this yeah but I have, a, we have friends in Malaysia. One of the techniques that was used to impact a young man was he was asked to strip naked in front of a group of men and hold his penis in front of them and speak a blessing by Jesus over his penis in front of all of those men. Wow. That for me is in the category of harmful trauma. Oh, yeah. Now, now, what we're seeing most That's often scary. around in the U.S. is disappointment. Disappointment and frustration and a lack of an environment where you can be authentic and okay. seen and cared for during the journey. And so yeah. in a lot of people in the West are experiencing harm because they were unable to be unable to be real with other people because of yeah. what they're experiencing and because of um, social mores in the church. And so then as a result of that, when you can't allow yourself to even confess and, yeah. and, and be fully seen, like Ken, one of the love, one of the things I love that Ken will often say is you can't be fully, you can't be loved unconditionally until someone knows your condition. <laughs> and wow, so like great. a lot of trauma is coming from just, um, suppressing suppressing those feelings and not feeling cherished yeah mm -hmm. what do you what do you think and you know the church the faith community can do to foster that sort of connection and understanding and yeah like you mentioned unconditional love because i do think the church has been more it feels like i'm generalizing obviously when i say the church that we lead with hey that's wrong and, and we're not we're not we're not really leading with like, oh, what, what's going on? H how are you? So what's your guys' assessment of how the church can foster connection, understanding, maybe be a bridge to healing? Like you, you mentioned in your story, Ken, like you're talking about like, well, how's that working for you? Are you okay? Are you healthy? 
Mm -hmm. I didn't feel any sense of shaming in that. that You weren't leading with like, you're a bad person. Um, So talk about that a little bit, Ken. Mm -hmm. The people that were the most helpful to me in my journey were just your average, you know, uh, father in the church community who just believed that he heard from the Lord and was anchored in scripture yeah. and just believed that my deepest identity was found in being a man of God yeah. and that any other identity really was not powerful in the long run. Mm. And, and so the, the few men that came along, you know, through my journey, um, I mean, so my heart was to not align with a homosexual identity. Sure. That, that was significant, I think. But then when when others could come alongside, like what I just described, and partner with that heart of mine, then it was just kind of basic discipleship, mostly from there. It's like, okay, if, you know, I would sit down with this uh, pastor on Saturdays for coffee. And I did that for about a year after I'd been at the School of Ministry at Bethel for three years. Mm-hmm. And he would just, you know, I, I would say, well, I, I looked at I mean, I looked at porn, gay porn this weekend, and he'd be like, oh, man, I'm so sorry, because he could tell I'm grieved over it, right? Wow. I'm feeling I did not feel like God was blessing that experience, <laughs> and I'm feeling really shameful. And so his concern was for how I was feeling and how that was separating me from feeling connected to God yeah. and, and how I was not experiencing God as loving father in all of that moment. Like, he knew that God wasn't happy about the sin, but what God was concerned about was the separation I was experiencing. So he, he would step in as a mediator and as a father. And he was like, well, Ken, okay, so let's, let's, let's pray, you know, and I would pray with him and I would ask forgiveness for my behavior. And then he'd be like, okay, that's on the cross. Jesus has already paid for that. That is no longer connected to you. Mm -hmm. And he would say, let me tell you who, who you are, Ken. I watch you and I see how you spend your time serving the ones around you. I see, I see how you know you will take your time ministering to somebody on the prayer lines, and and that woman that you were there, you know, uh, standing in the gap for her and covering her, and it, it all all these different. He would just, he would dim and he would he would hold up a lens for me that was, in my opinion, more how God was seeing me than how I was viewing myself. Sure. And he would remind me of the the father's heart for me and all this. And I mean, over time, I was able to borrow his lens for my life yeah. because I started to realize it was more accurate or it was more, it was more biblically accurate than wh- how I saw myself. Yeah. And that gave me permission to start to experience that, you know, not. Now, I mean, mind over matter does not work with this area of struggle. You just, that's why you see so much pain. I think that's why you see a pride movement is because, I mean, Elizabeth says that the the power of the pride movement comes from the depth of the shame. Mm. But these have been deeply marginalized people, like, and rejected in in, in years past, we know, like, outright ostracized and, Mm. you know, disrespected and way worse. Um, so there, there is this need to rise up and be valuable. So in answer to your question, Lance, from the, from the beginning, like, what can the church do is we, we hold on to what God says is true and best for us, but like, we love the one and we stop for the one, like Heidi Baker says, we stop for the one in front of us and be like, where are, where am I experiencing you coming from? You know, like. How, where's the pain? What do you need? How can I mean, just very basic? What are you looking for? And how can I partner with you to connect you to the Lord? It, it's way more about that. We, we can't answer all their questions. We won't even understand all of their questions, yeah. you know, but, but what we can do is help like, like pastor Hugh, Cum- Hunt, Hugh Cunningham did for me. We can have a lens for them as God sees them. Yeah. And we can eventually, eventually they can borrow that from us if they want to. I think, I mean, there's so much more we could say, but that's what was on my heart for the moment on, on your question. But, but being able to walk with people and, and the, the power of like acceptance versus, yes. versus the contrasting power yes. of shaming or, 
Yes. That's a really big thing. I, it's so simple to me. It's interesting to me how little that's talked about yeah. in this, I mean, this conversation. Interestingly, yeah. like I'm watching, I've been watching for a few years, this resurgence of, resurgence of discipleship in the church, you know, like, yeah. and COVID really emphasized it. Wow. We have got to become a community again. Yeah. And I feel like that is really the biggest salve that, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. that's what's needed is, is family. Like yeah. we need to become a family. We need surrogate parents. We need people who will be walking with us in discipleship with a great deal of authenticity and even mm -hmm. vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say that you, you triggered me to think this, like one of the best things that the church can do is when we come into a closer interaction with this person and we, you know, inviting them over, we, we pull them into our family or even just into our own lives then uh if that person can share some of their vulnerabilities if they can be like you know what i struggle with such and such you know like you you're, you're working on some areas of your life i'm working on some areas of my life you build the, you know that person builds the bridge out halfway yeah. then it's like oh i might have a safe place here yeah because depending upon what church environment they came out of or what family they or just their environment that they have experienced they're coming to the table with a bunch of assumptions about how you may or may not get, be going to treat them. Yeah. And so we have to, we have to demonstrate that we're going to be a safe place before they can open up, you know? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I was thinking of a story um, in a season where we were pastoring a church and yeah, somebody's somebody's that was on our team or his sister was um, in a gay lifestyle and was coming around and, yeah, she was just basically coming around us to, to see how we would react to her. You know, yeah. it was like she was testing us out. And and eventually she had some conversations with me specifically. And she's like, why haven't you kicked me out of your church? You know, and I'm like, I, and I just, I just like, I will stop. Let's talk. Like, what are you yeah. saying? Like, is that your experience of the church? And she's like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a lesbian. And it's like, oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know you're a lesbian. Now that I know you're a lesbian, I'm not going to kick you out of my church. Like, I, yeah, I think the church is supposed to be a place of, you know, safety and a place where you can experience God. And, and I think we all have things that we're walking through, you know? And so then I think that it does shift, doesn't it? When people are like, well, but you're, if they're adamantly in a gay lifestyle, I'm like, Anyways, I think leading with safety and like, hey, we can we can actually connect with each other versus leading with you're wrong. Yeah, I right. Don't how, I just don't know how effective that is. It's I think I it's that like, works anywhere about, about having like relational ethics, you know, like we relate yeah. to each other a certain way. So um, I, I think. Yeah, can I just say that please, also please. I, I think we shouldn't presume that the male experience is the same as the female experience. Yeah. And I, I think that. I think women in particular have have suffered from uh, women within the LGBT movement have suffered from the dominance of the gay storyline. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, for for a variety of reasons, like you you do find um, women who have felt like they were born gay and that was their reality from their earliest memory. Um, but even among those, women prioritize emotional relationship over sexual behavior. Yeah. As men tend to prioritize sexual behavior. Yep. And, and so you tend to see, like, if things are going to go sideways among men, it will be out of the number of sexual partners that they have where they're yeah. not able to create a lasting relationship, the lasting intimate relationship with another man. It's just, mm. man, you know, it's short lived. Yeah. Whereas with a woman, she would just go really, really deep. So if you have two women who women naturally connect emotionally, so then they get very, very deeply enmeshed with one another emotionally. Mm -hmm. So then you have a huge heartbreak. Um, so you see lots of a higher disease rate maybe among men, but then you have a lot of psychological psychological trauma among women. Mm -hmm. And then add to that, then there's a population of women who um, 
um, navigate towards same sex sexual feelings because it's safer than relationship with men. Okay. It's more familiar. It's like, I, I, I would say the majority without question, the majority of women that I, I have d discipled have been sexually abused okay. by men mm -hmm. yeah. and, and many of them, particularly the most butch have been uh, repeatedly molested by fathers or uncles or cousins. And, yeah. and so then, you know, interest, you build this kind of tough, it, interestingly, you navigate towards kind of a masculine or androgynous persona because it gives you this element of safety. And so yeah. unlike in the gay population, there is a population of women who simply are finding refuge in the arms of other women. Yeah. And that's not very widely, that's anathema to talk about. Okay. Um, because those are situations that could be addressed by by dealing with trauma and abuse and then understanding the male female dynamic like i so many women need to overcome the pain of having been raped by men yeah mm -hmm. so that added complexity is something that very very few people talk about publicly yeah i love that point and and any distinctions that you notice i mean i know you referred to the male tendency to the male inability to have uh, long-term relationships so thus they're bouncing around having multiple partners mm -hmm. anything else there as to why men generally end up in same-sex relationships and then and then maybe tendencies they're in as they are in a gay relationship well i don't think i could speak to why men end up in serial gay relationships like that yeah. um but i I can say that um, as a population, the gay community is really over sexualized. And so mm -hmm. yeah. like there is no restraint that the, you know, if you've ever met someone who has say a porn addiction, say an opposite sex heterosexual porn addiction, addiction, yeah. then psychologically you start to deal with what's missing emotionally in connection with people. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the very same thing in the gay community. It's like you are, um just responding to the impulses of your body and it can be really heartbreaking yeah. um at, so i mean it's it's maybe among the christian community more common to see two men who are able to have an emotionally sustaining okay. relationship but outside of the christian community there isn't that expectation and so yeah um, you might have a marriage but you often bring other sexual partners or into that okay yeah lance i, I mean I, if we're just stereotyping here i don't think i don't think it's a one size fits all but i think sure your question i think it's very common for the man to be looking for himself in the in, in another man okay. um, and and therefore you're constant it, it doesn't work so yeah. i can't i can't find myself in him and so i'm over here and so you have to go through one after another, I think, looking to try to, to, whereas I think like you're describing with two females, it was an emotional enmeshment. Like it was, it was yeah. intimacy gone too deep for yeah. what's healthy for that relationship. Um, so it may be, maybe the, the itch that's trying to be scratched is a little different. Some, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do want to say that God in God's wisdom, he unites a man and a woman. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, a man, wants sex and a woman wants emotional connection and there is a balance yeah, between the good. two if you separate them out when you have two men then you have a lot of that male impulse if you have two women you have a lot of that female impulse and you have no balancing factor yeah involved. that's really good yeah and i mean what would you guys say to that if if anything like i mean it is we are in a epidemic in terms of fatherlessness how, how does that play i mean i don't think that's as common in past generations throughout history like what we're in now is certainly unique mm -hmm. Any, anything to speak to there i think that that's a huge part uh, part of how we got here is yeah. is the ex the couple of generations now of pretty extreme fatherlessness 
Yeah, I, I can tell you that if if I you know this I don't I don't often get triggered now with a uh, if I notice a man it doesn't have this guttural sexual yeah. uh, thing that it used to have. Yeah. But I can tell you from all the ministry and therapy I've had over you know twenty plus years. Yeah. What I was looking for, if I if I really thought, oh, that's a that's a an attractive looking man. If I were to stop for a second and think, what am I wanting? What is, what is this draw? I wanted to be held mm -hmm. by a man stronger than me and protected. Okay. You know, so this is. I mean, I think wow. I was looking for. I mean, I think I was looking for a strong, kind father. Wow. It was the was the deep, you know kind of the some of the deepest expression of the emotional things I was looking for, yeah. And uh, you know I had a wonderful father, but not all of not all of the interaction that I think God intended happened. And there were other factors again that made me cancel men, and he was one of them. You know, yeah. there's a lot going on there, but that that need for, to come under the the protection and the covering of a father and to then find myself yeah aligning with him i i don't think i got that and it was huge for me well it's interesting your your comment of, i mean on your own story that like like being exposed to violent gay pornography was a gateway like, like something happened that, yeah. that's an interesting thought because i do think in culture there is a an idea about like well don't don't talk about right and wrong. There isn't really morality. Mm -hmm. And yet when there's like exploitive, violent be behavior mm -hmm. at, at the center of something, it's like, wait, this is not healthy. Right. Again, we're, we're trying to talk generally about what is healthy sexuality. And you were, it sounds like you were traumatized mm -hmm. and somebody walked you into a moment that was like, whoa, this isn't safe. It's not good for you. And it, and it led you down a pretty crazy path. It sounds like like a lot of pain, a lot of emotional turmoil. Yeah. And yeah. where you're maybe even canceling out elements of safe men that could could give you what your heart craved. But right. Yeah. I mean, I threw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. You know, so, I, I projected onto mankind like maleness. It's the, the worst of what I saw. And that was not helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what are you guys? Oh, go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, please. Well, I mean, I want to say beyond fatherhood, which I, I don't disagree that fatherhood is a major issue. Yep. But I think the bigger issue is family. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think, good. you know, of course, you can't have a family without a father. Yep. Um, yeah. But I, I think that the emergence of the nuclear family and the ascendance of the nuclear family, prioritizing that over the extended family, right? Um, our disconnect from our family and our family becoming no longer the safe space. Yeah. Like we no longer gain identity from our family like ancient cultures did, even like a century ago we did. And I think the mm -hmm. family has become uh, a nefarious place for some mm. and and so i i think honestly we we gain our sexual identity from those around us we mm -hmm. we don't gain that actually in a in a vacuum if we study psychology yeah and so if we don't have a safe environment and we don't have safe role models and we don't have an environment in which we are cultivating healthy relationships so we're sexualizing our children way too early. Children are sexual. Yep. Like children are, we are sexual being, beings. Totally. Children are sexual. They're going to be touching, feeling themselves as a means of self-discovery. Yep. But our romantic impulse, our desire to procreate does not come on until puberty. Yep. And we're forcing our children to have a mentality of sexualizing other people yeah. through our culture. Yeah. All those things together um is the perfect storm mm -hmm. yeah and then people will find family elsewhere like because again it's like I mean, a the LGBT community is a huge i yeah. i found family in the gay community yeah like, that was my place of belonging yeah 
Yeah, or maybe other people find it in in gangs, or maybe other people find it yeah. in, in work. You know, a mission. Yeah, I, I mean that's that's ideally, a really we would, ideally we would find it in the church. I think. Which which I think you know what is the church? The church would be those you know individuals who have a sense of faith in Jesus and live His way, right? So Jesus mm-hmm. followers and Jesus followers have a way about them, don't they? To love and to to build family and to establish a sense of community and like you're here and we see you and and there's a sense of greatness upon you and there's a destiny over your life and we we you know we support each other in that mutual pursuit of God's call on us and yeah purpose right but beyond purpose the being the like I, I I can be I'm accepted here I'm known I'm loved I'm seen yeah, I, I love drawing that distinction between fatherlessness and family. I think that's really necessary. And, and interestingly enough, like what is a family? A family contains that like male and female dynamic. It, it has diversity. It has like multiple elements. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's belonging there. Yeah. You know, it's not just, I mean, I think when you go into a work environment, you're there. Uh, I mean, if you've ever watched an episode of The Office, you see it on display. But you know, you're you're there not because you're belong. You're you're there to do something. Yeah. And you're you're valued for what you contribute. Um. But that's what's so wonderful about family is you just belong. You yeah. are loved regardless. And but I don't know if we always experience all of that in our in our families today. Yeah, I was talking to another uh, individual, an author in this same context and she had a lot of really profound things to say about empowerment and trust Mm. recognizing that sexual health includes those two very big words yeah like we're actually trust trusting of our emerging ones enough and empowering enough to allow them to make decisions and and it's more it's more common for people to re- rebel against a standard when they're told this is this is what you must do. Right. More more common for people to embrace their models when the models have been empowering and trusting and like, you know. Anyways, yeah. What what about I, I'd love to hear as we I think this would be the last thing we have time to really dive into. What about in terms of shift and change and um, things that you've maybe stories to share or encounters you guys have had as you've been in the midst of your mission with, with people coming to terms with like, Whoa, like I'm, I'm actually in the gay lifestyle and I'm, and I'm not healthy. And they're coming away from that and finding a heterosexual lifestyle, finding health. Um, anything in that space that you guys want to share? That would be, that would be a two hour segment to, I mean, that's where we spend all day and all night, I think. Because- I think every conversation I have, I'm always like, oh, we should have done a part one and a part two. There's always like, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I think in particular, uh, we're seeing, I- I'm intrigued right now by the trans, the transgender moment. Okay. And um, spending a lot of time building a foundation for people to recover from right now this cultural sweep of gender confusion yeah and and you know i want people to understand that what we're seeing now in the lgbt movement is not the same as 20 or 40 years ago yeah you know like over the last 10 years there's been a 60 percent 60 plus percent increase in the number of people who are identifying as lgbt and within that the largest group is non-binary or bisexual and so you know, just dealing with that. And and what we're seeing is a lot of, you know, a lot of children are being led to question their gender. Yeah. And one of the things that's not really widely understood is that girls and boys have different levels of hormones in their system that, like I read recently, that a girl has many thousand times more testosterone than a boy a prepubescent boy so girls have more testosterone than boys before they go through puberty 
And then when they go through puberty, wow. it dramatically switches. Okay. And so like a lot of girls who are the tomboy type are being yeah. like question, maybe I'm actually a man. Yeah. And that's causing a lot of harm for, for a generation. Um, like we spoke to a student from a, uni a university student a couple of weeks ago who she got to middle school and felt, gosh, I'm, I'm gender incongruent. Um, maybe I'm transgender male and, and was affirmed in, in that identity um, among her peers and then by teachers and in the local LGBT group. Yeah. But then when she got through high school, she was experiencing high levels of depression and, and bullying, even from within the LGBT organizations. Yeah. And, and so she didn't feel fully accepted in the LGBT groups, didn't know Jesus. And then when she came to college, she met the Lord. And in the environment where she was at, you know, the trans identity wasn't a thing. I mean, we were in they were into Genesis, like male and female. You were born a woman and you are a woman, irregardless. Like, no. I, I think people need to understand that womanhood is in the physical body. It's not in the stereotype. Yeah, that's like, great. We perceive, I could perceive masculinity, but there's nothing I can do to be masculine. Yeah. And so she she repented of agreement with these other identities. And now she's super getting healthy and becoming a beautiful woman and has walked away from that. And I, I feel like that's we're going to see that more and more much differently yeah. than like the really dramatic stories that Ken and I have of digging deep and and feeling, uh, you know, not we, we couldn't even connect maybe our experience to the cultural expression of gender identity whereas yeah. she can yeah um, we have um yeah so what is we only minister to people who like come and are saying can you help me leave this life behind like we we don't have nearly enough time to try to help that group of people so yeah. we don't spend any time I, I know we have some friends who are more evangelistic and are out there trying to give love to those that are, you know, actively in an LGBTQ life. And I love that because those people do it very benevolently. Yeah. Um, but like we have, because that's what we're going after. I mean, we see amazing testimonies. I mean, my friend Jeffrey lived 20 years in drag <clears throat> in a, in a drag nightclub and on, on, you know, on drugs, alcohol, Mm -hmm. very depressed all of that until jesus walked into his kitchen one day and boom i mean he has a brand new life like he had had all the surgeries you know everything had been cut off and all that but now he is consecrated to jesus and that is all he wants to talk about he is in love with jesus he's not having he's not hospitalized anymore with depression blah 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 you know we have another friend on our on our staff now who she went into a worship service with her girlfriend, encounters God during worship, and boom, she has experienced no same-sex attraction since that moment. Wow. Like we have, you know, I, I was meeting with a young man in the last few months, and, you know, he's trying to understand why, a uh, young man in, in mid-20s, he's trying to understand where did this come from? I don't want to live a gay life, but where, why do I feel this way? And as we were asking the Lord, to show, you know, where did this come from? He's realizing, oh my God, he has this aha moment. Oh my gosh, I got rejected by the, you know, head cheerleader type girl uh, mm -hmm. when I was, I, don't, I think he was probably in third or fourth grade, something like that. A, a dating okay. prospect. Yeah, yeah, a dating prospect. Like he was, he was pursuing her. Yeah. And um, he said, actually, I was girl crazy at the time, had forgotten that. Yeah. And she gets totally rejected. And he, that happened a couple of times to him in that oh. window of time. And he realized wow. this is too painful. I will never be able to get this close to the, these girls this way. So I'll just become one of them. Wow. You know, I mean, we ha we see, so it, it's so unique. Yeah. Though, and complex. And complex. Like, I, you know, I realized that like um, homosexuality is this, intimacy breakdown that the enemy capitalizes on okay <laughs> and That's and crazy. so we we're we're trying to in all of our friends i mean we know so many we, have, we know hundreds of people who've come out of homosexuality yeah. and it's like those of us that are really walking with jesus you know it's like we know there's pain in there so it's like we're not trying to change you we're trying to 
it's you know if you're if you're coming asking for help it's like let's talk to jesus and see if there's some places where the enemy has taken advantage of a place where you were wounded yeah. and we're and so in answer to your question i mean we are seeing that all over the place the lord is either just coming in by his own volition like yeah. stepping into a kitchen or he's partnering with different psychologists you know that, that have a heart to help a person pursue their own life goals and yeah. honor their faith and then inner healing ministry and but the the testimonies abound and that's what the changedmovement.com is it's just this movement of testimonies of jesus meeting people uh, yeah, I was going to ask, so where do, where do people find you guys if they're interested in either following you or learning more or jumping in to what you're doing? Well, I mean, with Changed, Changed is a grassroots network of people like us who have left LGBT. And so okay. you can go to the Changed Movement website and hear stories like ours. We, we, we seek to protect that space for people legislatively. So we address public yeah. policy matters. You can see some of that on our website, just because we yeah. want to protect, we want to protect this option for people who identify as LGBT. But then we yeah. also co-lead a ministry called Equipped to Love here at Bethel okay. Church that, and it's in that space that Ken and I do the most teaching and discipleship and, and it's the fullest expression of our ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Equipping leaders. Yeah. And, and where would people find that? Is that also online or is that just. Mm -hmm. There's a, a Facebook page, but really equipped to love.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. So changed, changed. Movement. What's the website again? Changed movement. Dot, com. Okay. And then equipped to love.com. Yeah, any, I mean, any, if you're interested in testimony, it's probably the best place to go is our Instagram account. So if you go to changed MVMT, changed movement. Okay. Um, we try to post testimonies there every week or every so many weeks. Nice. Well, this is good, guys. I love it. Um, I, I love where we landed. I think I think that's a really perfect moment to maybe stop this, but so much wisdom in here. I love, yeah, I just love that we finished up with the whole idea of like intimacy, brokenness, when mm -hmm. intimacy is growing. Yeah, I love that. And what do you say? You said that again. You said something about like. Yeah, I'm, in my opinion, homosexuality is an intimacy breakdown that the enemy has capitalized on. Yeah. I, so that's a great statement, intimacy breakdown. Wow. And like, okay, is there mm -hmm. vulnerabilities there? And well, yeah, we've talked about a lot. I really appreciate you guys taking time with us. Um, thanks for, for chiming in on this big, big subject of healthy sexuality. Wow. Wow. And thank you for what thanks you guys are doing. Us. Keep up the good work. Um, look forward to future conversations. Hope you guys are open to that. This has been really good for us. We, pre thanks. we appreciate what you're doing too, Lance. So beautiful. Just appreciate your heart. Thanks, brother. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, with that, we're going to say goodbye. Guys, thanks for jumping in with us, and we'll see you soon. Take care.